What's going on everybody? In this video, we're gonna be getting into optimization. And to optimize something means to get the most out of something, to you know create the ideal situation. And so you are trying to maximize or minimize something. So I don't know why this is, but the first two examples that came to mind that you guys could relate to was maximizing the speed that you could drive without getting pulled over and minimizing the effort needed on a homework without failing. So yeah, that's basically optimization. And in this video, we're gonna be using Cal calculus to do some more of these optimization problems. All right, so let's get into this video. So in this video, we're going to start off with an introduction, right? And I'm just going to do this quick. I want to compare optimization to related rates because they're pretty similar in the sense that they're both word problems that involve calculus to solve. Okay. And then we're going to do just a bunch of examples, right? It's structured very closely to my related rates video. In the first problem, I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step process. It's going to be more of like a training wheels kind of thing. Um, it's going to be much longer in this example. And then I'm going to shorten that step-by-step -step process for uh, the next problem that we do. But in that first example, I'll really give you the full scope of, you know, all an optimization problem entails. Okay. So that's all coming in this video. And of course you have the timestamps on the left. Now, as always, I have the unfinished and the finished notes in the description down below. So you can definitely check that out if you're interested. And lastly, before we get into this video, I quickly wanted to mention my full Calc 1 course, which I'm going to have linked in the description down below. When I was in Calc 1, I would learn the topics in class, do the homework that night, and then like most of us, I would start forgetting pretty much everything within a week. Now, I don't want that to happen to you because you know you could probably relate to this. It makes studying for tests, midterms, and finals way more stressful when you're starting from square one. And that's why in my full Calc 1 course, I have a bunch more practice problems for you to try. I also have video explanations for every problem in the course, so you don't have to waste time scratching your head. So if you're interested in that, be sure to check out the link in the description down below. Now let's get into this video. So I want to start off here with that introduction. And basically what I have written here uh, is that optimization is basically, you know, just finding maxes and mins, right? That's all this, this optimization stuff really boils down to, but it's disguised in this gross word problem. You got to kind of get a visual for what's going on from that word problem. And that I think is the, the hardest part, right? But really it just boils down to a max and mins problem once you have all that done. Okay. And so it's pretty similar to related rates. It's again, a word problem that you need calc to solve. And I wanted to just create a little table quick and talk about the differences between the two. Okay. So both are going to start out in the same type of way. You're going to get a word problem. It's going to give you, uh, most of them will give you visuals for what's going on. You're going to draw that visual. You're going to label it. Right. And so they, they start off the same way, but then they kind of deviate a little bit. With related rates, you generally just need one equation, right? You're going to have one equation and then you're going to use implicit differentiation heavily, right? You're going to be like, you're going to have something that varies in time, right? That you generally deal with time with related rates, right? Because you want to see how something is changing in time. That's the rate that you are. Uh, those are the rates that you're trying to relate. So you have something like, let's say the Pythagorean theorem. Right, that's a very popular one for related rates. And what ends up happening is you take derivatives implicitly, right? Because all of these guys, A, B, and C are gonna be changing in time. Cause like, let's say you have like some right triangle that's expanding, okay? And so what you get is like two A, A prime, um, two B, B prime, two C, C prime, right? And that's implicit differentiation, okay? And these, these A primes and B primes I'm drawing are derivatives like dA over dt, they're derivatives in time, okay? But that's not really what happens at all with optimization. With optimization, now you don't really need one equation, you're gonna have to have multiple equations. We're gonna talk about later a main equation and a helper equation as well, okay? And so you'll have this main equation that you're trying to, you know, we when we have uh, something that we're trying to find the max or min of, we take a derivative of it, we set it equal to zero, find the critical points and use a sign chart, right? And so we have one equation that does that. But what's going to happen here is we'll have something like, oh, the volume is X, Y, Z, right? Or actually, I think even a better example, the area is equal to X times Y, okay? is for something like this, how are you going to be able to take a derivative when you have two variables over here? 
right? And so what ends up happening is you have this mean equation and you have a helper equation. And this helper equation kind of relates x and y. So you'll have something like y equals 2x. And so what, what you'll be able to do is substitute that into the mean equation and get rid of one of those variables. And so now what you can do is you can take a derivative. It's, it's like a normal derivative, right? You're just taking a regular derivative with respect to x, right? So this is 2x squared. The derivative would be 4x, all right? That's optimization. So the derivative taking process is going to be much more straightforward. There really isn't any implicit differentiation ever in optimization problems. But uh, yeah, the having multiple equations can be a little rough. So with that in mind, let's get into the uh, first example for this video. We're going to have 2400 feet of fencing. And we're trying to fence off a rectangular field. Okay, we're only going to need to fence in three of these four sides, however, because one of the sides borders a river. Okay, find the dimensions of the fence that will contain the largest area. So this is a max and min problem, right? But the thing we're trying to maximize, and this is something we'll, we'll talk about later in this step-by-step -step process, but here we're trying to maximize area. We're trying to find the largest area. That's what we're doing here, right? And so we're going to have an equation for the area. We're going to take a derivative of it, set it equal to zero, find the critical points, and there you go. Okay, so that is what's going to go on in this problem. So we're going to move on to the, the first step here, just start off this problem strong, and that is to draw a picture. And we already see here that it says rectangular in the problem, so we'll draw a rectangle first. And I should add on to this process, we want to label what's going on here. Okay. And we have two sides and we should, or four sides, but uh, we should label them, right? We'll label them as X, Y, that we can label this one as X and this would be Y. But one of these sides, we don't have to count. And it doesn't matter which you don't count, whether it's an X side or a Y side, it doesn't matter. We can just get rid of this one and uh, say this guy borders a, a river here. So I'll draw a little river. It's very well drawn. I could like put that on eBay and sell it. So anyways, that's our, our drawing and we've already labeled the sides. It's good to label the side length, right? We know that if we're trying to maximize area. This thing is going to have some, some area here. Problem two or step two says to figure out what we want to maximize or minimize here. We're trying to maximize area. We talked about that. And so that's area. Step three, we want to create an equation for the area. We want to have that area equation that we can later take a derivative of. The equation of area for this rectangle is going to be x times y. Okay, and that's something that you can point out very easily once you actually label this appropriately. Step four, create a helper equation using the other information. To create this helper equation, and a lot of people have trouble with this, you need to look at the other information in the problem, right? What else is given? What haven't we accounted for yet? Because here you can see that we didn't talk about this 2,400 feet. We haven't constrained this. That's why some people, instead of calling it a helper equation, they call it a constraint equation because that's really what it is, right? It's an equation that's keeping us within our limits and our limits is 2,400 feet of fencing. But what is 2,400 feet to us? Well, it's the perimeter of the fence, the perimeter is 2400 and that can be represented as 2x plus y okay x plus x plus y step four is done step five is going to be to solve this helper equation we're going to get one of these variables by themselves okay and the reason why we do that again is to get this main equation to be in terms of one variable Okay, so we can take a derivative of it. So in solving here, I'm just going to write out this thing without the P because I don't like having two equal signs. And uh, we'll just subtract 2x on both sides here. And then y is already going to be by itself. Okay, and so now we have something that we can plug into our main equation. So make sure you plug that in now in step six, we get area is 
x times y is now 2400 minus 2x. All right, and you can distribute that through if you'd like it. Would probably help you take a derivative a little bit quicker. Okay. Step seven, take a derivative. So this derivative, right, to take a derivative, we're taking a derivative of x's. So you put a d over dx on both sides. I'm not gonna show you all the notation and bore you with that. But uh, what I do wanna know is how to label this a once you've taken a derivative of it. You label it as dA over dx, all right? Because you're taking a derivative of a and the variable that you're uh, taking that derivative with respect to, right, is, is x. Cool. So d over dx is going to be 2400 minus 4x, just a little bit of power rule there. And then we move on to step eight, which is to set it equal to zero. Okay, why are we setting this thing equal to zero? Well, remember that we set things equal to zero to find critical points. Right, and these critical points are places where we could possibly have a max or a min. It's places where our slope is zero, right? And when we have a slope of zero, those are max and mins, or they're like y equals x cubed, right? And y equals x cubed, the slope goes to zero right here, but it's not a max or a min. And so you can also get those two. That's why we call them critical points and not immediately maxes or mins, okay? So cool, let's uh, actually solve this in step nine. Okay, and but from here, like the, the process should seem pretty natural to you, okay? We're just adding four X on both sides. We're dividing by four. We get that X is equal to 600 feet. Now I'm gonna circle this here. Okay, and you know, sometimes, and, and I will say this too, I just wanna say this quick, uh, a lot of teachers like for you to use sign charts to prove that this is a maximum and they'll show you, they'll tell you to use first derivative test, set up that sign chart, all that stuff. To, to me, I'm not gonna do that in this video because really it's already kind of obvious. We got one answer, it's definitely a maximum. And usually when you get multiple answers, it's very obvious that the answer like you'll get like zero feet and like oh yeah that's definitely not going to be a maximum right that doesn't make any sense there's no area if your one of your side lengths is zero feet so that's why i generally stay away from doing that it just makes these problems a little bit quicker i'm able to go through them a little bit faster okay but i do have you know videos on the first derivative test if you want to check that out so moving on to step 10 here Okay, I have 11 steps total. Again, I'm going to shrink this down quite a bit in the uh, the next problem. So step 10 is to solve for the other variables. And well, there is something else that we need here. We've found X, that's one of our side lengths, but we need Y. And so we're gonna plug in to our helper equation, right? That's gonna come back. And actually this one is, is the best one. They're, I mean, they're all the same equation, but here we already have it solved for Y. So we'll use Y is equal to 2400 minus two X. And then y is 2400 minus 2 times 600, which is 1200. And we'll write feet. Sorry for all of those of you who use the metric system. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'll make it up to you. But yeah, be careful though, because I've, I've circled these answers and they may not be what the actual question is looking for, right? That's why in step 11, I say reread the problem, reread what it's asking for. Here it's asking for the dimensions of the fence, which will contain the largest area. We found those, those are X and Y. But sometimes they'll ask for what is the largest area possible. And so you'd have to find X and Y and then plug them in for your area, right? And so that's something else that you could see. So moving on to the next example, I did spend quite a bit of time on that last one. This one, I'll, I'll go a little bit faster. Uh, just wanted to get that initial explanation out there. But this example says a cylindrical can holds a volume of one liter. Find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the metal required to build the can. 
okay? So before we even get into, you know, thinking about what equations to use and all that stuff, well, let's just draw a picture. Okay, that's the first step. We're gonna draw a picture and we're gonna label it. And also here, you do see that I've, I've uh, condensed that step-by-step -step process quite a bit. Okay, so first step here, drawing a picture of a cylinder, I mean, listen, it's, I'm gonna do the best I can, but it's not gonna be nice. I don't even know where this thing's going. All right, there we go, it's looking good, okay. All right, that's that's beautiful. Exquisite, one of my dad. So we have a radius, we have a height, and we have that this thing has some volume V. Okay, and I only put the volume there because it talks about that in the problem. And that's just how I would label it, right? That's the main three things that we care about with a, with a cylinder, right? And so I just initially write that down, but in step two, now we actually have to find the main equation. And so we have to understand conceptually what's going on here. We're trying to minimize the cost of the metal required to build this can, right? And so we're trying to minimize cost, but it's the cost of the material required. We don't get how much the actual material costs. What we wanna do is just minimize the amount of material that we're using, right? Because if we minimize the material we're using, then we minimize the cost, right? You see how that's kind of like like the same thing? And so how do we, you know, what, what equation would we use for minimizing the amount of material that we're using? Well, remember this cylinder is hollow, so we're not gonna use the volume equation, right? We're not trying to, we know that the cylindrical can needs to hold a volume of one liter. It's hollow, right? And so the material is the surface area, right? That's what we actually care about here. We don't care about the thickness, leave that up to the engineers to figure out what's structurally sound and what's not. We care about the dimensions, we care about the surface area, okay? So that's where the uh, the actual material uh, is gonna go, right? Into that surface area. So we're going to create an equation here that tells us what the surface area is of, and I'll, I can, write that with a, uh, a variable s, if that's cool with you guys. Okay, and so surface area, or actually, you know what, I'm gonna use a, okay? And so the area, the surface area of this guy is gonna be those two circles, and that is gonna be, well, the area of one circle is pi r squared, we have two circles, so it's pi, two pi r squared, and then we add on the area of the body. And remember, if you unravel a cylinder, right, it's got that height of H, and it's gonna unravel to be the circumference of that circle, which is two pi r. And so the area of this guy would be two pi r H. Okay, and that right there is your main equation. So now with step three, we're talking about the Helber equation. And what other information haven't we talked about yet in this problem? Well, we haven't accounted for that the volume has to be one liter. So that is going to be our Helper equation. Now, I'm going to convert the units here. One liter is a thousand centimeters cubed. And the reason why I'm doing that is because, well, we don't wanna express dimensions in liters, that really doesn't make any sense, right? It, it makes sense to express the volume in liters, but not dimensions. So I'm gonna convert this right now. We should know that, um, know for future reference that one liter is a thousand centimeters cubed. Okay, and so that's gonna help you here. Now the formula for the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h, right? It's the area times the height, right? You take the area, you extend it into the third dimension. And so now we just can solve for one of the variables here and that's step four is to combine. Or sorry, uh, no, not step four yet. <laughs> so we want to solve right now and then we'll plug it in uh, in the fourth step for the main equation. But I'm going to solve for H here because I'd rather plug in for H than plug in for an R squared and an R. I feel like that'll get really messy. If we just divide by pi R squared on both sides here, 
we'll get that a thousand over pi r squared is h. And that's something that we can plug in there. And if you're getting a little upset about that, I'll move the h over to the other side. All right. So now we're going to plug that in in step four. We get that our area is 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r times 1,000 over pi r squared. All right. And we can cancel here. Cancel the pi's, cancel the r with the square, and we're left with area equaling 2 pi r squared plus 2,000 over r. Step five is going to be to take a derivative. Okay, and now this is where the, the process should start to get really familiar to you. This is stuff we've done with max and mins. So step five, take a derivative with respect to r. And we're gonna get here, this will be a four pi r minus this will be, this is just the derivative of like one over x, right? I told you to remember that the derivative of one over x is negative one over x squared, right? I've talked about that in past videos. It's a very common derivative. But now what we have is we have a one over r, and so that's gonna become negative one over r squared. And yes, we're being multiplied by 2000 here, but that can just, you know, carry over. So instead of one, we have 2000. Okay, but that's a very important derivative to remember. Like this clicked for me just because I remember this. And that's why I want you guys to as well. Or else it's, you know, it'd be a little bit of a nightmare to think about. So now we've taken our derivative number six. Step six is to solve this. So we're going to set it equal to zero. And we're going to solve this baby. So. You can see here, right, when we're talking about finding our critical points, it's not just where this thing is equal to zero, it's also where the derivative is undefined. Okay, and here's an example that I was talking about earlier. You can see here that the derivative would be undefined at your uh, r equals zero. And r can't, that doesn't really make sense for r to equal zero, does it? Because then you don't have much of a can, do you? <laughs> so we can already eliminate that and just be like, all right, well, that's garbage, get that out of here. So what I'll do is I'll ignore that fact and we'll multiply by r squared on both sides. You could also find common denominators. So whatever you really wanna do, I don't wanna pressure you either way. But you get the zero here is gonna equal four pi r cubed minus and then the r squareds cancel off so you just get a 2000 here. Okay, so now let's add 2000 to both sides and if we do that, we're gonna get four pi r cubed is equal to 2000. Okay. And then we'll just divide by four pi on both sides. That'll give us that r cubed is a, where is it? 500 over pi, there it is. I didn't have to look at my sheet for that, but I did. <laughs> Then we're gonna take the cube root of both sides to get r by itself. And so r is going to equal 5.42 centimeters. So we got that part, but we also remember need to, we need to find the other dimensions, right? Because that's what the problem's asking for. So we're gonna also find h. So again, make sure at the end of the problem that you always check for that. So we'll use the helper equation here. I'll bring this down. Oops, pasted the image. There we go. And then we'll plug in the H is, or actually I can even do that up here just to save space. We get 1000 over pi times 5.42 squared and we get that that is 10.84 centimeters. So right there, you have the dimensions of the cylinder that 
has a volume of one liter, but has the minimum material required to build it. Okay, cool. So now let's move on to this green section. Okay, so this problem says Jeff wants to construct a box whose base length is three times the base width. The material used to build the top and bottom of the box costs $10 per feet squared, and the material used to build the sides of the box costs $6 per feet squared. Given that the volume of Jeff's box must be 50, or 50 feet squared or feet cubed, <laughs> find the dimensions that will minimize the cost to build the box. Okay, so first off, we're going to draw a picture here. This is a box. Okay, it's got a length, a width, and a height. So we can draw our box here. I'm going to try my best. Let's do this. Let's do this. Oh, yeah, this is coming out great. I can already tell that you guys are jealous. Cool. There we go. So there's my length, my width, and my height. Okay, we know it's going to have some volume V. And you'll notice that this problem is pretty much the same thing as the last problem, right? We're trying to minimize cost again. Same idea. And we're given a volume. That's going to be our constraint equation, our helper equation, right? But, well, what's the other stuff for? What's the dollar stuff about? Well, it's, this, it's the same that it's going to be taken into account in the main equation. We're still dealing with surface area here. It's just now the top and bottom cost different than the, the sides, right? They cost different amounts. And so it's kind of like uh, computing an average in a way. You, you have to like weight different things, right? So we can create a surface area equation. And I think that'll be good to do for step two. Let's just talk about what the surface area of this cube is. And well, that's gonna be two times the length and actually, before we even write that, we know that the length is three times the base width. And so we can already just do L equals three W and put that here. That's what I would already do. I would say length is three times the width, put three W in for the length. Okay, it is technically a helper equation and you can have multiple helper equations if you have multiple variables to get rid of. But uh, yeah, I would just plug it in already so you don't have to keep plugging in different things into your surface area equation. So doing these faces, right, the front and the back, that's gonna be two because there's two of them and you're gonna have three WH, okay? Then we're doing the top and bottom now. Okay, that's gonna be two, three W squared, right? Because that's gonna be the, the area there. And then on the right and left sides, those are gonna be W times H, and there's two of those. Okay, so we'll just uh, multiply these out a little bit. We're gonna get six WH, and actually this is a, this is also a side, this is a side, this is a side these are going to combine to be 8WH and this guy is 6W squared that's for the top and bottom and I say to you know I'm, I'm talking about the sides the top and bottom because they each have different costs associated with them okay the top and the bottom cost $10 per feet squared okay so this is the area of the top and the bottom 6W squared and so for every, this is going to give me an answer in feet squared. And so the cost of the top to produce the top and bottom is going to be 10 times 6W squared, right? Because it's $10 per feet squared. This is in feet squared. So it's, you know, just some unit conversion if you want. So it'll be 10 times 6W squared. I'm just going to do that part first. Sorry, I'm kind of reversing the order of things. And then it's $6 for the side. So it's going to be 6 times eight WH. Let's combine some like terms or not combine like terms. We're multiplying out <laughs> 60 W squared. And then we have six times eight. That's 48 WH. Okay. And that right there is going to be your main equation. It's a little bit of work, but I also, you know, if you 
don't already know to do this part, uh, I, you know, I did it all out starting with surface area. Okay. So it just takes a little bit of, of critical thinking to, uh, to do step two. It quite often can be the, the hardest part of the problem other than labeling what's going on. Step three is the helper equation. Again, that's going to be the 50 feet cubed. And so 50 is our volume. That is going to be equal to length times width times height. And the length is 3w. The width is w. The height is h. And so 50 is equal to 3w squared h. It's the same kind of thing that we had last time. Now we have uh, W's instead of R's. I don't want to plug in for those because there's two of them there. We have a W squared too. I'm just going to plug in for the H. The H is going to be here dividing by 3W squared. We get 50 over 3W squared. Okay, that's the helper equation that we're going to be plugging in into the main uh, in step four. Okay, step four here, plug into this guy, get that the cost is equal to 60 w squared plus 48 w times h is now 50 over 3 w squared. So we cancel a w with a square and we get c is 60 w squared plus 48 times 50 over 3 is 800. That's over w. Okay, that right there is your cost equation. Now in step five, we take a derivative and then we're going to solve. Okay, take a derivative here. We get DC over DW. That's what we're gonna write it as now. And that's gonna be just some power rule, right? 120W minus, right? If you, if you get that derivative from last time that we did in the last problem, you should understand that this derivative is 800 over w squared and it's negative now. Okay. Setting an equal to zero and solving. Again, we can see that the denominator is going to equal zero when w equals zero, but we don't care about that because the width can't equal zero. It just doesn't make sense for that to happen. So like we're good. We can multiply each side by w squared. And we're going to get the zero is 120 w cubed minus 800. And we can solve for w. Add 800 on both sides. That gives us 120 w cubed is 800. Divide by 120 on both sides. You get that w cubed is 20 over three. That's what this fraction simplifies to. Then we cube, or not cube, take the cube root of both sides. And you finally get that W is 1.88 feet. Okay, so once we took that derivative, which was again, just power rule, a lot of the times it, it usually is just power rule. But we took that derivative pretty quick here, we set it equals zero, and we solved. That's really all it took. So now we can plug it in plug this within and find the other dimensions because remember that's what the problem asked for and we know that length is three times w so that's going to be quick to find the length is 5.64 feet the height is the height equation that we had is 50 over 3w squared and uh, plugging in that w is 1.88 you're going to get that the height 
is 4.72 feet. And right there you have your three dimensions. Moving on to our next example, now we're gonna talk about the distance formula. Okay, this is what this problem is going to revolve around. And this problem asks, find the point on the parabola y squared equals two x that is closest to the point one four. Okay, now just drawing a picture of this, you really don't have to if you don't want to for these distance formula problems. Um, if you, you might not even understand what y squared equals 2x is going to look like. But to fix that, what I would do is uh, just think about it as switching the variables. Uh, just think about it as 2y equals x squared, right? Divided by 2 on both sides. This guy's a parabola that goes upwards like this. And so this guy is a parabola that goes sideways. Okay, that's just how I like to think about it. Right, it's a it's a sideways parabola. So if you want to draw it, you can. I'm not going to draw something exact here. But let's say this is our parabola. And then we have a point 1 comma 4. Let's say that's up here. And we're trying to uh, minimize that distance. Right, because we're trying to look for that, that closest um, distance. So we'll call that D. Okay? Cool. So that's step one. We're all set there. We need to actually find an equation that will do this, though. And I've been talking about this. That's going to be the distance formula. But you got to understand how to use it. And that's something that people will struggle with. Okay, that, that's actually, again, the main equation is one of the hardest parts of any optimization problem. The distance equation that you probably know is the Pythagorean theorem, right? It's x squared plus y squared. It's going to be that distance in the y direction, the distance in the x direction, right? Forms a right triangle. But the problem is that if you just apply this blindly, this is actually going to give you the distance from the origin because this distance is x, right? Or let me write that with a different color this is the true distance x right and this is going to be the distance y okay so the distance that you'd find if you use that equation is going to be right there and that's not going to work we need to find the distance from this point and this points at one comma four and so it ends up being kind of like uh you know if you remember the equation of a circle right we're going to do kind of the same thing we're going to move the center of this thing to one four so this becomes d squared is going to be x minus 1 squared plus a y minus 4 squared. Okay, so we just flip the signs, right? This is positive, this is positive, we make them negative. And there you go, you have your distance formula. And that's going to give you the distance from this point to whatever you want. Step three is to find that helper equation. The equation that we haven't taken into account, into account yet is that y squared equals 2x. And you can solve for y here by just square rooting both sides. But honestly, that sounds gross to, to plug in and do stuff with. So I'm just going to divide each side by 2 and solve for x. Right? Always try to make it easier on yourself. So when you do that, you get x is y squared over 2. I'll put that over here so I have more room vertically. And now we just combine them in step 4. Right, you see how this kind of flows after you get the hang of things? Right, it's, it's just it's pretty quick. So we combine step 4. d squared is now going to be x minus 1 squared plus, remember, or sorry, uh, x is what we're plugging in for here. So this is going to be y squared over 2 minus 1 squared plus a y minus 4 squared. All right. So from here, you could probably see that to take a derivative, we would have to square root both sides, right? To take a derivative of d. But that's going to be really messy, wouldn't it? That would be a really gross derivative to have to deal with. And I mean, nobody wants to do that, right? So think about this. If you have minimized 
your distance, right? If, if your distance is at a minimum, then wouldn't your distance squared also be at a minimum, right? If you're already at the minimum distance, you're at the smallest number that you can get. If you square it, you'll get the smallest d squared, right? So your distance squared is going to be at a minimum at the same x and y point that your distance is at a minimum. Right? It only makes sense if you have a list of numbers from 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? you square all of them, getting 9, 16, 25, 36, and 49. The two minimum numbers, right? the, the minimum square is going to come from the minimum number here. Right, picture this as being d and this is being d squared. The minimums occur at the same line. Okay, so what we can do is we can just find the minimum here and we know that's gonna be the minimum of our actual distance. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna rename this function d squared and I'm gonna call it z. Okay, just cause it's gonna be easier to think about when you're taking a derivative. You don't wanna have like a, a d d squared over dy, right? That doesn't really, that doesn't really look good. So I'll just replace the d squared with a z. And that derivative is gonna look a lot nicer. Okay, so I'm just gonna rename it here. It's just a copy paste. <laughs> All right. And now we are ready to take a derivative of this thing, right? So taking a derivative, we're gonna use some chain rule here. I'd, I mean, you can distribute these things out if you want. I'm not going to. We get a, the two comes out front and then we have leave the inside alone. This is now to the first power. We're gonna multiply by the derivative of the inside. The inside uh, is this piece and the derivative of it is gonna be, well, this is a two y. When we take a derivative, it's over two. So that's just gonna be y, right? That two's cancel. And so that's the first piece. We add the second piece. That's gonna be a two, bring that out front again. Y minus four to the first power. The derivative of the inside is now one. Now notice here, I, I just wanna make sure you're not getting confused. Why do we not have any Y primes here? We're taking derivatives of Y. Well, the reason why is because this is an implicit differentiation. We are actually taking derivatives with respect to y, not with respect to x, where y is a function of x or, you know, whatever. That's a completely different story. This is a derivative with respect to y. That's the thing that we're trying to take derivatives of. And so we just take them normally. We're treating them as if it was x. Okay? So that's the difference. This is just a regular derivative. This is not implicit differentiation. Okay, I think that's something that I probably struggled with when I was in calc. I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure I was having trouble with that for a while. You know, sometimes we include y primes, sometimes we don't. You got to know the difference. So we can go about simplifying this here before we solve it. And we see the two is going to cancel with this two here when we distribute that through and we get a y squared, right? And then we get a minus two because the two times the, the one there. That's multiplied by y, we'll distribute that through in the next line. Then here we get a two y minus eight. Okay. Now we have dz dy is y cubed minus two y plus two y minus eight. Those cancel. dz dy is y cubed minus eight. All right, that's your derivative. Now you're gonna set it equal to zero. Okay, let's solve it here. We add eight on both sides. Y cubed is equal to eight. Cube root both sides. And you get that Y is equal to two. All right, so great. You know that Y is two that's nice, but you're trying to find the point on this parabola that's closest to the point. That's what this problem is asking for. And so to, to define a, a point, 
right? To, to talk about where, where a point is, we need to have both an X and a Y coordinate. And so we're gonna use this helper equation to do that. Okay, you know, the X is Y squared over two. Let's plug in that Y is two. And we're gonna get two squared over two, and that is two. So X is also gonna be two here. Okay, and so the point, I guess I shouldn't have circled those in blue because they're not our final answer, but the point is two, two. And that right there is your answer. So now we're gonna move on to a inscribed example. Now these last two examples, the both the inscribed example and uh, the, the box example where you have to cut things out, these are two of the harder problems that you would see for optimization, the problems that really get a lot of people confused, uh, especially you know when you're talking about inscribing something, people don't even know what that word means. And so uh, yeah, I think I needed a good refresher of that when I got into calc, so don't worry if you're the same way. So step one, right? We have, we have, we're trying to find the area of the largest rectangle that can be inscribed in a semicircle of radius R. We're gonna have to draw a rectangle inscribed in a semicircle, okay? What does that mean? Well, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a rectangle here, okay? And for something to be inscribed, what that means is that it's literally inside of it Right, and so here's our semicircle. This is gonna be the base of it. And this semicircle is gonna come up. It's gonna to touch the points of the rectangle. It's gonna connect, I can't, why can I not draw going left? My hand like drags across the screen. Here we go. There's your semicircle. Okay, and this thing has a radius of R, so that's gonna be this distance here. Okay, that's what, I mean, that, that's just a visual representation of what inscribed means. It means the rectangle, you put that inside of the semicircle, right? And for it to be maximum area, right? I mean, you could have your, your rectangle uh, here, but that's not gonna create your, your maximum area, right? And so I guess it, it should only make sense in general, even if you don't really understand the idea of inscribed. It surely makes sense that your rectangle should come up all the way and touch the semicircle. Okay, circumscribed is the opposite, right? You would say here that this semicircle is circumscribing, it's going around this rectangle, but the rectangle is inscribed in the semicircle, right? And so that's the, the difference in wording. So we got to label this thing, and honestly, you know, if we're talking about circles here, it just makes sense to me for us to label this kind of like it's on the, the X, Y axis, right? And so, yeah, you could label your, your rectangle as this guy being X and this guy being Y. I feel like that's a little overcomplicated though, because, well, because in the X, Y axis, this length would be X, right? And I think that's gonna make your life uh, a lot easier down the road, okay? It'll make your life easier down the road to have this label as X and this label as Y because, well, we're gonna use the equation of this semicircle later in the problem. That's gonna actually be our helper equation. So that's the labeling part and I know that can be, it's probably the, the toughest part of the problem to be honest. But step two, I mean, that's just gonna be the main equation here, right? That's the area of the rectangle because we know that's the thing we're trying to maximize, right? We're trying to find the area of the largest rectangle. And so two, step two is just the area of the rectangle. That's gonna be, well, this length of the rectangle is two X, right? And then you multiply by the width or the height, whatever you wanna call it, that's just gonna be Y, okay? So that's your area. It's your main equation. Your helper equation is gonna be what? Well, what haven't you taken into account yet? You've taken into account that this is a rectangle. You've talked about the area of it, but have you introduced R? Have you introduced the fact that it's inside of a semicircle? No, you haven't. And so you need to use the equation of the semicircle, right? That's the only thing that's really gonna help. This thing is inside of the, the semicircle. It's constrained by it, 
right? And so it's got to be included as an uh, extra equation. And that's going to help you also get this area equation down to one variable. So you might remember that the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared, right? And you've probably done this like one time or another in algebra. Um, you probably tried to prove your teacher wrong that you could like solve it for y and that it, oh, it's perfectly fine. Um, and then you just like mess up with a plus or minus or something. Uh, <laughs> what I'm talking about is that here, uh, if you actually solve this thing for y, y is equal to plus or minus r squared minus x squared. Right, you can, you can do that yourself if you'd like. But that's the equation of a full circle. And what happens is when you, when you graph a circle, the top part of the circle is, where, is the plus. The bottom part of the circle is the minus. And so actually what we can do here is we can graph this semicircle using, if we only use just the positive part. Right? And so I'll write here a little note, eliminate negative, and you get a semicircle. Okay? And so y is now the square root of r squared minus x squared. That's your helper equation, right? And cool. So now we have that, we can combine them. Our area is going to equal 2x times the square root of r squared minus x squared. Okay? And we can take a derivative of this. It's going to be a little bit of product rule, but we'll be all right. We get the dA over dx is going to equal. Well, let's take a derivative of the first piece here. That's the, the 2x. Taking a derivative of that, we're going to get 2, and that's going to be times the square root of the second piece, the r squared minus x squared. Then we're going to add the first piece, left alone, times the derivative of the second piece. How would you take this derivative? Well, first realize that the variable that we're taking it with is, is x, not r. I know it might be confusing because you have two variables under here. But... For this guy, what we're going to do is realize that the, this is a chain rule. It's a giant chain rule problem. The derivative of the square root of x is something is the other derivative that I really told you to memorize that a lot of people uh, don't really worry about too much about telling you to memorize. I would say to memorize it because it pops up a lot, like in this example. Square root of x is the, the derivative of that is going to be 1 over 2 rad x. Right, and so that's the exact same thing that's going to happen here. You're going to get a derivative, and it's going to be 1 over 2 rad. Well, it's not x anymore. What you have inside this radical is r squared minus x squared. Okay, and so you'll be doing some chain rule to actually finish the derivative. So we have 1 over 2 rad r squared minus x squared. And the derivative of the inside, the derivative of r squared minus x squared is negative 2x. Right? The r is, a, is treated as a constant if you're taking a derivative uh, with x. And the r is a constant anyway, right? It's just like, like r could be like 3, right? And that's it. That's all r is. You don't like change it like you can with x and y. So now we can simplify this. We're going to get the dA over dx is 2 square root of r squared minus x squared, right? That stays the same. But here we can do some simplification. Okay, the, we'll have a two cancel here. And we have the x's being multiplied together. We have a negative two. So we're gonna get a negative two x squared over the square root of r squared minus x squared. Now in step six, we set it equal to zero. And we solve for x. Now, of course, here, again, we, we have a denominator, so we got to make sure that you know, that thing being zero, if the denominator was zero, it wouldn't matter to us. And, well, let's see. 
What value of x would make this denominator zero? Well, x could be plus or minus r, right? Because if you took a, if you, you know, squared plus or minus r here, it doesn't matter if you're, if it's positive or negative, that's why I have the plus or minus here, you're gonna get r squared, right? You square both sides here, you get x squared is equal to r squared. And then you have an r squared minus an r squared, and that's zero. So x being plus or minus r is something that maybe we would have to worry about. Well, let's think about this. If x was r, that means that this rectangle would extend all the way out here, right? Because x, this length would be the same thing as this length. But there's a problem with that, isn't there? If the rectangle goes out to the end here and touches, it can't go up at all, right? Because it, it can only go as high as the semicircle, right? Or it's got to because it's inscribed inside of it, right? So what we do is we throw out that solution because it won't have any area at all if it doesn't go in anywhere into the second dimension, right? Into the y direction. So we can conclude that that's not a, um, not going to be a max, right? If anything, it's a min, because it has literally no area. <laughs> so let's multiply by the, uh, I'll actually draw it here, because I don't want to right over any of that or cross any of that out. We're gonna multiply here on both sides by the square root of r squared minus x squared. Or you could find common denominators, whatever you'd like to do. When we, multiply th when we multiply through by that, we're gonna get that zero is two times r squared minus x squared. Then here we're gonna get a minus two x squared, right, because the square roots cancel off here. Distributing through, we're going to get 0 is 2r squared minus 2x squared minus 2x squared. This is going to be a minus 4x squared. And so, we, sub we can actually add 4x squared on both sides. We can divide by 2 giving us that, uh, or actually, we are trying to solve for x here, so I'm gonna divide by four, right. So we get that x squared is equal to r squared over two. Square rooting both sides, we get what x is equal to. x is plus or minus square root of r squared over two. All right. And that's x, cool. What is the problem asking for though? It's asking for the area of the largest rectangle, right? So it's not asking for the dimensions, it's asking for the actual area. And that's why you need to go back at every, you know, at the end of every problem and just make sure you understand what it was asking, make sure you're actually circling that as your answer, not just like the dimensions in this case. So to find this area, we have x, we need y. Well, we can find that using our helper equation. We know that y is square root of r squared minus x squared. And so we can plug that in down here. I rearranged stuff, that's why it looks different. Uh, just gotta give myself room to finish this problem here. y is equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared. We know that x squared is plus or, well, since x is plus or minus the square root of r squared over two, that means that x squared is equal to and actually we had it up here already, x squared is equal to r squared over two, right? So we can actually just substitute that in. y is equal to the square root r squared minus r squared over two, okay? And that's just, I mean, this is essentially like one minus one half, it's gonna be one half, right? So this is the square root of just r squared over two. So y is the same dimension. 
So the, the largest, the area of the largest rectangle that can be inscribed inside of a semicircle is actually a square. And I think that should actually make some sense to you, right? So that's cool. We have the dimensions now. We just have to uh, multiply them together, okay? And so we multiply them together. The area, it really doesn't make sense to talk about uh, negative area. So we're going to leave the negative out. Area is 2xy. We're going to do 2 times the square root of r squared over 2 times y is r squared over 2. And so we get the area is, well, we're multiplying the same thing here. So the radicals are just going to go away. And we get 2 r squared over 2. Right, because if you multiply these two things together, you get r squared over 2. And so the 2's cancel. You get that the area is going to be r squared. Okay. So that, that, was a, that was a pretty big problem, but still, it's, you know, not the, the end of the world. Really, you just got to, you know, realize here you got to set up the problem correctly. I think that's the hardest part. Remember how we referred to x as this guy. And so the area wasn't xy, it was 2xy, because this entire thing is the area, okay, or is the is the, the side length, okay, and understanding what inscribed is, circumscribed, right, having a good idea of what the differences are, right, you know, again, the rectangle is inscribed in the semicircle, the semicircle is circumscribing the rectangle, okay, that's what that looks like. All right, cool. So let's uh, let's move on to our last problem here. So the last example I have for you is the box example. And this example I saved for last because it was the most annoying thing ever when I had to learn it in, in calc. And so it's, it's just weird how it you set it up. It's like the inscribed example. It's kind of awkward to set it up at first. But once you get the hang of it and how to set it up, the problem is actually not the worst thing in the world. Okay, that's that's really what it is for these optimization problems is just setting up the problem, you know, drawing a picture, labeling it and creating your main equation. Those two things are generally the hardest part of optimization. If you can get that from there, it's just like a regular max or min problem. Okay, so let's get into this one. So the problem says we have a flat sheet of cardboard that we'd like to make into an open top box. The dimensions of the cardboard are 50 centimeters by 20 centimeters. In order to fold the sides up to make the box, we cut equal sides squares out of each corner. Find the height of the box that maximizes its volume. Okay, so for this problem, we start off by drawing a picture and labeling it, right? It's the same as everything. But here, you got to understand that we're actually trying to build a an actual box here, right? We're building an open top box. This is how you would, you know, like you've probably done like projects in like elementary school of building a box and cutting out the corners or something like that. I don't know. Just taking a wild guess. Ah, uh, this rectangle looks awful. Hang on. I can do this all in one swing. How this box is actually going to look is well since we we cut out the squares so we can actually fold it up into a box and so we cut out these little guys in the corner right here right these are supposed to be squares and they're all equal size and what i'm actually going to do here is i'm going to label x and x i'm going to label these these lengths as x and of course they're going to be the same because they're equal sized and they're all squares okay now we know the entire dimensions are 50 by 20 or I guess that would make sense for this to be 20 and this to be 50 okay and just imagine what it's like to, to fold this thing up I mean picture these guys these corner pieces as being gone what you end up getting is something that looks like this. That's awful drawing, but still you fold the flaps up and you have an open top box. You obtain something 
that looks like this. And here is some true artistic talent. I actually practiced drawing this one. Okay, there's your front piece. Now you're I'm drawing the top of the box. Okay, and it comes down. You have no idea how hard I'm trying right now. Okay, cool, and then this is gonna come down inside the box. Look like this. Bam. Yeah, I know, it's pretty crazy. But anyways, this is exactly what you get when you fold the flaps up here. And so, you know, you don't have to go out and draw this, but if you visualize it like that, that's really all this problem does, okay? So, what do you take out of this? Well, the actual thing it's asking for in this problem is the height of the box. And the height is actually going to be, well, X. Think about it. If you fold these things up, right, well, this side length is X. And just think about folding this, this side up right here, this side. Fold it up and you get that that is your X, right? And so it's your height of your box. Now, the width of the box, if you call this guy the length, this guy the width, and this guy the height, right? The length is not 20 and the width is not 50. Because you're cutting out some length from that, you're cutting out two of these X lengths, okay? And so that is going to uh, be going into your helper equations later on, okay? But uh, we're trying to, to find the, the height of the box to maximize its volume. So we're trying to maximize volume here. And that's going to be the main equation. So 2 is going to be volume. And that's the length times width times height. That's pretty easy for this problem. But step 3, those helper equations, that's what I was talking about with the uh, width and the length. The width is actually going to be 50 that entire length, minus two of those little x lengths, because all the width is is this guy right here. When you fold it up, right? So 50 minus 2x, right? Your length is 20 minus two of those x values, or two of those x lengths. And your height is, of course, x. And so we can plug all of this stuff into this main equation, and that's step four. our volume ends up being 50 minus 2x times 20 minus 2x times x. Let's multiply that out. Our volume is going to be 1000 minus 40x minus 100x plus 4x squared and then we got to multiply that all by x. Okay, that was just distributing these two guys. So now the volume, or a completed volume, and combining some like terms here, we get that our volume is 1000 x minus 140x squared plus 4x to the third power. And now we're ready to take a derivative. Taking this derivative, we get that dv over dx is 1,000, right? This is just power rule, minus 280x plus 12 times x squared. Okay. Now you set it equal to zero in step six, and you're going to solve it. To solve this guy, I would really just use quadratic formula. I would re rewrite this thing as 12x squared minus 280x plus 1,000 so you don't mess yourself up and call this A and this C. But plugging into our quadratic formula here, we get that x is equal to negative b. That's just going to be positive 280 plus or minus the square root of b squared. That's 280 squared minus a 4 times a is 12. C is a thousand. 
and that's all over 2a. There's 2 times 12. So if you go through and you compute the two solutions that you get out of this, you're going to get that x is equal to 18.93 and x is equal to 4.40. And so at this point, you're like, okay, well, how do I have two answers here? And you might think about using a sign chart to actually go and figure out which one is which. But again, you can use common sense here, right? Think about these two lengths. How do they fit in with the drawing? Could x, could we see x being 18? Well, no, right? If, if x was 18, then this at length right here, that would, that's what we're calling 18. And so that would spread all the way over here. And then you have another cutout that went all the way back. And that just doesn't even make any sense, right? So that doesn't just, it just doesn't make sense for that to be an answer. This is too big. Okay. Again, if you get two solutions or anything like that, before you use a sign chart, which sometimes there are, you know, where you want to use a sign chart, but really, I mean, here you can look at it and just be like, oh yeah, 18 is way the heck too big and it's not going to work. Okay. So that means that X equal 4.40 is going to be a dimension of this guy. Right. So, and that right there is actually the height, right? That was what we were asking for in this problem. So if you want, you can change X to H just to denote that that's your height. It, it's completely up to you. I think your you know, teacher would get the point if you wrote X here. Okay. But yeah, guys, that is going to do it for this video. I hope this was able to help you. I know this was uh, quite a lot of examples. Hopefully, you know, you, you started to get the hang of the entire process as you go. Really, it's just those six steps and, uh, and yeah. Now, if you're interested in plenty more practice problems, especially on stuff like optimization, definitely check out that full Calc 1 course in the description down below. But yeah, guys, that's going to do it for me. I'll see you soon.